We ready? Good evening and welcome uh, this evening to the school district. Yes, I feel alive there. I'm just so, so much better. Man, to the school district of the City of York Recovery Plan Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, happy Easter, everyone. Um, we're going to start and keep rolling uh, so I can honor your time on this beautiful evening and you can hopefully get a little bit of the warmth outside. Um, tonight, we have the administration. We'll start with the approval of the minutes of March 9th, 2021. We sent those to you with your agendas. Um, are there any, any questions or would anyone like to make a motion to accept? And approve the minutes from March 9th. Make a motion. Okay, it's been moved by Dr. Love. I second it. Seconded by Ms. Sweeney. Any corrections? Any questions? Comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, and it's approved. We'll go now to the uh, March financial report. You, in your packet or in the email that you received from Ms. Farrell, uh, you received a copy of the February, this one. So that came to you. So that's for your records. And now tonight, Sean's going to go over the March financial record. So, Mr. Hain, if you're ready. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thu. Um, yeah. Uh, you can hear me okay, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so our uh, revenues are looking good as we look at the top. Um, item 6,000 is our local revenues. We're right at about 90%, uh, which is right on track. We got another quarter to go. Uh, state revenues uh, will go up as of April because April is a uh, subsidy payment month. So that will definitely go up during April and our federal revenue uh, are the grant uh, allotments that come in and they, they do come in periodically as well. So those are on track as uh, we see it as well. Uh, as we go down, everything else is staying pretty consistent. Um, one thing on item 1500, which is the non-pubs that is probably, it, it, that tends to be a little back ended in the school year as our federal programs director uh, coordinates expenditures with the non pub So that will increase. It's showing right around 12% right now, but that will definitely increase as we progress in the, in the year. Um, going down into the 2000 series, one thing I do want to point out that uh, if you can recall from, and, and you can refer to your minutes uh, from last month's report, but item 2,900, I, I believe I had mentioned that that was a little high. Uh, so I did look into that. It was showing that we were 122, let me see here, 122% of budget. Uh, and I thought that was kind of strange. So I did investigate. There were some miscoding errors. So we fixed those. So now it's showing at 80%, which is um, a really reasonable level and, you know, there's not a lot that flows through there. So it was just a, a typo in the um, payment schedule. Uh, everything else is consistent as we go down. And if you look at the bottom line of our profit and loss statement uh, for this fiscal year, we're showing a fund balance of uh, 7.6 million and combined with prior years, we're at 26 million. So uh, we're still holding firm and um, it will hopefully continue to do that uh, as the year progresses. Uh, are there any questions? I have a question because I don't remember. Where does the fund balance come from again? The, the fund balance is part of uh, the say, you know, basically over the years, 
Um, it it's contributed to the basically revenues minus expenditures. So, uh, like I said, so for just taking this year as an example, if we were to stop this year, we would be seven point six million dollars ahead. You know, meaning revenue more than expenditures. So the twenty six million is a result of prior years all combined. So yes. you know, for for the past couple of years, we've been building up our fund balance. Now, okay. naturally, as we progress in the year, more expenditures will come out and we'll still get more revenue. So that that 26 will definitely go down. Um, and our goal is to have a break even or positive fund balance for the year as well. So we have. So, yeah. Does that make sense? No. Yeah, that makes sense. But that's not what I, I want to know. How do we get I, I don't understand how we get that extra money because it's extra money, correct? Well, Where it's not that- extra money. It's it's kind of if you could equate it to your bank account. So if if you cut off the year and you you don't spend as much as your earnings, so you have a fund balance that rolls over to the next year. So basically, it's it's a combination of all revenues minus expenditures throughout right. the year. So our budgets that we put out there, we're not spending as much as we're saying we're going to spend so that That's, ends up being a fund balance correct correct yeah and and a budget is basically is a guide you know to help control expenditures and uh it it is a guide to help you know navigate your revenues and expenditures throughout the year so not all the time you're not i I've never seen anybody come in, you know, exactly 100% of both things. So, so basically we we're we're controlling our expenditures and that's how the uh, fund balance grows over the years. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Are there any other questions for Mr. Hayne? If you get a chance and you look over the, uh, the financial report for this month and you have any further questions, please feel free to you know contact us. We'll be glad to get back to you and provide you with any, any uh, answers that we possibly can. One thing uh, to note is that um, as we were going along, we are using uh, ESSERS and uh, ARP money. And so that has saved us some local dollars that we did not anticipate saving because of uh, spending the money that came from the federal government. So that has helped us. And uh, if, if you had a chance to tune in on Monday to the proposed budget for 22-23, Dr. Barry provided a very detailed uh, outlay of the ESSERS funds as well as the local revenues the state revenues and the federal revenues versus the expenditures. So there's a whole lot of detail in that presentation that she did, and that will be posted uh, for anyone to look at. And the board will deliberate uh, next Wednesday at our board meeting on the proposed budget. So we can post it then for 30 day review by the public. So please don't hesitate to ask if you have any questions. Okay, uh, Dr. Barry, are you? Yes, yes okay. sir, I'm here. Would you like to uh, lead us into the uh, uh, the plan for tonight with uh, the overview for first ten? Sure would. Good evening, everyone. It is good to see you all. Hope you all got a chance to get some of this wonderful sun and are going to be able to enjoy some of this day, the rest of this evening. Um, I'm dying to get out in my garden this weekend. Um, So we are um, tonight doing something a little bit different than we would normally do. Um, You don't get the pleasure of hearing my mouth in a presentation, lucky you. But what we are going to do tonight is we, um, we, each month, we have different topics between some of our other meetings. And so we had the pleasure of having Dr. David Jacobson with us in our faith-based meeting. And Dr. Jacobson is our um, first 10 lead, and he is do, he is in charge of all things first 10. It, it, he's a consultant that we've hired to help us 
to get that program off the ground. So we, um, with his permission, of course, we were able to record that meeting and um, you, so you can hear that presentation. First 10 is an initiative where we talk about the first 10 years of a child's life. And in the school district of the city of New York, we're adopting this philosophy that we want kids to be bear cats from birth. And that idea is that before families um, and students of school age even get to school, we wanna build rapport and relationship and make them feel safe about the choice of being a part of our Bearcat family. So the first 10 initiative is allowing us to do that. Now, every school in the district is not a first 10 school, but the district does benefit from first 10 initiatives. First 10, first 10 initiatives, such as we have a common form that we're utilizing with all of the, day, the pr private and public daycares in the, in the district, around the district, as well as the pre-K programs outside of the school district of the city of York. We are able to um, share resources and professional development with those organizations. So by the time the kids get to pre-K, they already are in the groove with what we do in the school district of the city of York. We also um, have kind of graded services in that we have the um, services from CIS, Communities and Schools, as well as Communities of Hope, and some of the other stuff that we are working with to, to be in the schools. Right now, we have two first 10 schools. We have Ferguson as a first 10 school, and we also have Hannah Penn. And, um, and we are going to have good, hopefully, joining next school year. Eventually, we would want all of our schools to be first 10 schools because of the relationship building that we establish through that partnership. So without further ado, Mr. Ferguson, I am going to ask you to pull up the first 10 um, presentation and I will do my best to answer any questions that any of you may have after the presentation. There's going to be a slight delay till he gets the video to uh, broadcast to you. So just okay. bear with us. In the meantime, I had the um, distinct pleasure today to participate in a um, webinar with um, ASCD, which is a group of administrators, and it was their superintendents group. And they asked me to present about our um, initiatives with First 10 in the district. Um, it was an early childhood consortium group. and. Um, there were all superintendents on the line and they were very impressed with some of the things that are going on with York. York is one of, I believe, four districts in South Central Pennsylvania that are participating in First 10. And uh, we're pretty proud of the work that we're doing here in York City because we are the only district in Pennsylvania that is that has a true community school in Hannah Penn and, um, Ferguson and what makes them the community schools are all the wraparound services that we have pushing into the school. So we're real excited about that. That work is getting a lot that that work is getting a lot of traction in the immediate community around the state and now nationally. So so you know look out because you're going to be hearing a lot about our initiatives for early childhood. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry. Uh, it is uh, really a pleasure to be here today. I am looking forward to uh, uh, talking with you all. I am excited about the uh, opportunity to have a discussion with the faith-based uh, community in, and community leaders in the city of York. Um, and it has been a pleasure to collaborate with Dr. Uh, Barry in uh, steering this important work, really reaching out to children and families and supporting them uh, in their development uh, uh, through the First 10 initiative. So uh, our agenda today, I am first going to describe for you about what First 10 is and the really exciting partnership that the city of York has created, the co collaboration between uh, the school district 
and early childhood programs and health and social service uh, programs, including the library, really all with the idea of supporting children and families from birth all the way through their education, educational careers, and um, really making the city of York a great place to be born into. That's our goal. We want um, uh, uh, York to be really a good place to be born into for uh, uh, children, for babies. And um, as Dr. Barry refers to it, it's, uh, it's about bear cats from birth. It's really about the school district and our early childhood programs and uh, other health and social service nonprofits collaborating together. So that's uh, agenda item number one is first 10, that partnership. And then uh, I'm going to go into more detail about a specific initiative. And this is an initiative that uh, our faith-based organizations and our faith-based leaders in the city of York can really be helpful around. And that's the Basics Parenting Campaign. And so I'm going to share that with you as well, in, including some very concrete ways in which uh, you all can support uh, this work. And so with that, I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to ask the host to allow a, a screen sharing. I'll just pause for a moment while we get that set up. And then I'll be able to share some slides with you. I'm also going to share a couple of short videos with you about the basics. OK, there we go. All right, thank you so much, Kara. Okay, so um, uh, I am David Jacobson. I work at the Education Development Center. We're a large mission-driven nonprofit focused on education, health, and expanding economic opportunity. We work in all 50 states and across the world, and we do a lot of work in early childhood and elementary school education and care, and that means that as we do this work in York, I have a lot of colleagues that I can draw on for additional expertise. So as we think about FIRST 10, this partnership between the district and early childhood programs and health and social service agencies, there's really three big ideas that, um, th that we center this work around. And the first is that research supports a community-wide approach to the first 10 years. So everything that we're doing is based on research. And the idea here is that it's not about the school district working by itself or the early childhood programs, each one, the, the church programs, the YWCA, the YMCA, each one working on its own. I mean, that's important, but we have the best impact. We do best by children and families if they work together on a community-wide approach. And if we think of, and if we don't, if we think of children's whole development is not just, oh, the early childhood years and the elementary school years, but think of that as one continuum so that the, there's a very smooth transition as children get older. And that really maximizes their learning and development. The second big idea is that across the country, innovative communities are really creating a first 10 roadmap. These are communities that I've studied and written uh, applied research reports on and also communities that, uh, that have been implementing the first 10 model like York. And York has really become a very uh, innovative, leading edge first 10 community. And uh, Dr. Barry and I are presenting to 100 other superintendents next week as uh, part of the, uh, uh, the National Superintendents Association. And uh, we've just been invited to also present at the, uh, the, the Federal Office of Head Start for a roundtable that the director of Head Start is um, organizing. So we're, we're doing innovative work here in uh, the city of York, and we're sharing that nationally, and we're learning from other communities. In fact, um, York is going to be joining a first 10 network a network of 25 or 30 communities across the country that are all implementing this same approach and that are going to learn from each other. And what's, what's really integral to First 10 is that it's an approach that focuses on teaching and learning, partnerships with families, and uh, comprehensive services. So some programs focus more on the, on the family side and the partnership side, and others uh, focus more on teaching and learning. We really think all we think all three are important, and the research supports this. 
improving teaching and learning, partnering with our families in culturally responsive ways, and providing comprehensive services. And so First 10 provides a framework, a planning process, and a set of strategies to guide local partnerships. And I'm going to give you some concrete examples about what those strategies are. We always like to ground this work in the fundamental challenge of poverty. Uh, nationally, 45% of US children under six live in low income families. That uh, is a much higher number uh, in the city of York. And we know that the full achievement gap is present when children enter kindergarten. So nationally, we have a consensus among many politicians, among experts and among the public that investing in the early years is important, but how we do that is critically important. Uh, we have a, often a lot of, we have gaps. We have a lot of fragmentation in the ways that we support children and families in those first 10 years. We typically have, um, in most communities, a gap between zero to five, meaning all the programs for young children and for um, uh, our elementary schools, our K-12 systems. We have gaps and we have gaps between education, health, and social services. So we, we have a fragmented world. We have a lot of silos in education and early childhood education. And what we're trying to do to, in First 10 is bridge those silos. And our faith-based organizations can be a, a help in that. And we're gonna, we'll, I, I will be uh, clear in showing you some concrete ways in which you can support this work. And so nationally, there's a trend to really, as I said, begin thinking about um, early childhood and elementary school years as a continuum and thinking about improving quality at each stage of development and improving coordination and alignment so that each year builds on the previous year and particularly bridging this gap between early childhood education and the early years of elementary school. And we're doing some exciting work in York uh, around that work that's really helping, we think, um, young children. So here's the first 10 framework. We, this is how we pull these ideas together. We begin with a commitment to educational and racial equity. And we summarize that in the expression, all children learn and thrive. So we want, um, we really want to uh, um, eliminate gaps by race, by income, by other cultural factors. And we want to eliminate disparities and outcomes for all children. And by Learn and Thrive, we have in mind health and mental health outcomes, social emotional learning outcomes, and academic and cognitive outcomes. And then we implement three uh, broad strategies and some specific practices under each of these strategies. So around collaborating to improve teaching and learning, this is we want your children, whether they're coming from the YWCA, from a district pre-K classroom, from a Head Start classroom, or directly from home. So think of all the uh, families in your churches and whether, they're, whether those children are enrolled in an early childhood program or not, we want, them to have, we want them to be prepared for kindergarten and we want them to have a smooth transition to kindergarten. And the research here is clear that when children get off to a good start in pre-kindergarten and in kindergarten, that helps them the rest of their lives. Can't underscore that enough. We really want children and families to get off to a good start in their first year, zero to three, and then uh, ages three to five as they transition into kindergarten. So we're doing a lot of work in York making that transition to kindergarten as strong as possible. The second strategy is to coordinate comprehensive services. And so this is really about connecting families to services. And we do this really in two key ways in York, I'm sure in many ways, but two key ways I'll flag for you today. And the first is that Dr. Barry and her team have really created in the, um, uh, the, the K to eight, pre-K to eight schools, um, what's called community schools. So uh, they have uh, uh, worked with other nonprofit and health organizations so to connect those directly to the schools so that families are introduced to these services at the schoolhouses. And they can help with all kinds of health, mental health, guidance, warm coats in the winter, um, dental, vision, um, uh, all kinds of, I think, you know, connections to legal services when, when needed. So all kinds of supports through those 
pre-K to eight schools. And then secondly, we've created school connected play and learns. So for particularly with children and families who aren't in early childhood programs or aren't in Head Start, this is a great way to build relationships with them, introduce them to schools, introduce them to principals and kindergarten teachers, um, but also connect them to health and social services. And then the third strategy is to deepen partnerships with families in culturally responsive ways. This is about elevating uh, family voice, building a cadre of champions. Uh, the district does a lot of work with this. Your early childhood programs throughout the city do, do, a, do a lot of work with this. And one way that we uh, support this in through First 10 is through our basics parenting campaign. And that's what I'm going to be going into, into more in more detail. Uh, in just a minute. So I'm going to tell you all about that campaign. And then it's really important that we lead strategically and continuously improve. So this is what it looks like in the city of York. We have an advisory team of organizational leaders from the library, from Community Progress Council, from uh, other uh, nonprofit organizations, from the school board. We have a family advisory uh, that then um, provides additional advice uh, to us uh, to support our work. And then we have three citywide teams, one focused on that important transition into kindergarten. The other is creating school connected play and learn groups. The third is working on early literacy pre K all the way um, uh, into elementary school through second or third grade. And then we have two first 10 hubs where we're taking that community school idea and where we have those partnerships with health and social service agencies, and we're pushing that down to ages zero to four so that all of those children and their families benefit from those services even before they get to school. And we're gonna, we've got, we're doing that at Ferguson, we're doing that in Hannah Penn, and we're, and starting in the fall, we'll be doing that in a third school, uh, the good uh, pre-K to eight school. So that's what first 10 looks like here's a picture of play and learns during the pandemic where we had to do them virtually we're back to uh, uh doing them or soon we'll be back to doing them in person and um this is uh from last summer uh, it may look like a uh, you know not that exciting picture but this is a super exciting picture last august 2nd we brought together pre-k teachers head start teachers and kindergarten teachers to collaborate together for a whole day really knitting together uh, the way that we support children in the city of York. So uh, that's our first 10 partnerships, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, about that. Uh, any quick questions about our first 10 partnership before I go on and describe the basics? Okay. Um, uh, if anything comes up, I'm happy to answer any questions that come along. So let me talk about this citywide parenting campaign. Very exciting. And this is uh, something that we would love the support from our uh, faith based organizations and all our partners throughout the city. So uh, why the basics? Why do we implement, want to implement this parenting campaign? This is a parenting campaign that is focused on uh, children ages zero to three, although we can extend it and um, uh, through ages four and five as well. We know from the research on the brain that 80% of brain growth happens in the first three years. We also know that gaps between groups, so gaps by income and gaps by race are clear in the national data by age two. And so, um, the good news is that we know from the science what to do, what the lived experiences are that really make a difference in those first three years. We also know that those gaps are hard to close. It's much easier to close gaps between lower income families or lower income children and their more affluent peers early. It takes a lot more work to close those gaps in high school. If we can close those gaps in those first few years, children are uh, off to a good start. And one way to make this concrete for you are these are pictures of brains. And these are the development of neurons. 
And what you see from as you compare a newborn to a one month old to a nine month old is you're seeing more connections across neurons. And then look at two years old. By two years old, you see this dense web of neurons and you actually see fewer as, a, as an adult. That's because these, connect, these connections called synapses are pruned over the years. If we don't use them, we lose them. So it's really important to have a rich um, language environment, a rich uh, visual environment, and interactive, loving relationships with children so that we are strengthening these neural connections in our brains at an early age. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show with you a video that really um, uh, uh, shares what uh, the basics are in a nutshell. So and I have it all set up for you. And please jump in and let me know um, if you are not hearing the sound on this, but you should hear it by. Now I know my ABCs. Next time, won't you sing with me? Learning begins the moment your child is born. Baby, baby, baby. Do you want to play too? Every child is filled with vast potential for success in life. <laughs> and those first three years can have the greatest impact on your child's learning. Apple, look. Where's the strawberries at? Yes, that's lemon too. And kiwi. Wow, awesome job. It's all about giving a child a proper start. That's what being a parent is all about. Yay, we didn't like that song. I wanted to make sure that I was here every day. Such a joy. Every parent of every background can make a positive difference in their child's life. It's peeling. Oh. A few simple, everyday activities can make a big difference. And those are flowers. That's why The Basics is working with research and community leaders to promote an important new initiative. The Basics are five simple principles that we want everyone to know. The first of the basics is to maximize love and manage stress. The second is to talk, sing, and point. Let's take the bath, a lovely, lovely bath. The third is to count, group, and compare. One, two, three. The fourth is to encourage and enable movement and space and play. I got it. Use. And the fifth is to read, but not just to read. We want to read and discuss stories. Whoa, what is that? These are the five fun and simple things that every parent can do beginning from birth. Oh, yes. Let's all work together to make sure our children can become the best, most well prepared they can possibly be. Maximize love and manage stress. Talk, sing, and point. Count, group, y compare. Explore through movement and play. Read and discuss stories. Okay, so th that was Ron Ferguson, a professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard University. He's the, the founder and uh, developer of um, the basics. It was uh, funded largely by the Black Philanthropy Fund. And I um, want to pause there and just ask any, um, any reactions to the video that you've seen uh, so far? Well, thank you, Dr. Jacobson. That was truly amazing. You know, Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Uh, yes, yes. It's, it's inspiring, you know, just to, to know that a, a child can learn um, from birth up until two or three years old. Mm -hmm. um, but my question would be, how 
can parents be inspired, especially if their child is not a part of um, uh, kindergarten or right. early development? Right. Um, because the, the parents have to be involved. They have to know also that their children can learn through play, uh, that their children uh, are open to learn. That's right. Um, you are absolutely right about that. And so your, uh, your work is cut out for you. Especially, for, those parents. <laughs> Especially for, the, for the parents, to get the parents involved, that they might be inspired, That's you know, right. um, uh, to yeah. want to educate their children. That's right. That's exactly what we want to do. We want to inspire them to 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 um, as their as their children's first teachers. Uh, we really want to uh, support them. And the five basics are a really good, simple way to do that. And that's what we're going to be doing in the city of York. And and we're going to we're going to ask our our faith based organizations to help out with that. All our early childhood programs, our library is already on board. We're asking everybody to um, to join in on that. And so, uh, Catherine Rose, you really just set us up for the rest of the what I'm going to share with you because I'm going to share exactly how the campaign works and and how our faith based organizations can uh, contribute to that. Uh, so thank you for that. We're gonna I'm gonna keep coming back to your question. Um, okay. Is there another? Was anybody else have a, a reaction to the basics, um, or you want me to to, to proceed uh, to keep going? Any other questions? All right. One thing I like to just comment on, you sure. know, seeing this reinforces that you don't need a whole lot to teach. Everything around you can be used in mm -hmm. one way or another, and so a parent doesn't have to worry about, oh, I don't have, you know, a whole pile of resources. Mm -hmm and uh you know just going walking down the street <clears throat> yes you know, things right. like that right. and there i love the one the mother said this is a flower <laughs> you know, that was yeah. that's great and i love that when they when they were talking about pulling into different objects and naming those objects that's, objects right. that's right yes we could even get our grocery stores um you know mm. we could get our grocery stores to put you know signs up in in kid friendly language and then encourage the parents to say this is a banana it's banana mm -hmm. it's a yellow you know it's yellow uh yes. this is whatever uh people always say it talk about eggplants when they use the you know it's purple um the um okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna share now a couple of more uh slides about how this campaign works and um answer catherine rose's question so we know from the science that brain pathways are built and strengthened through interactions that are loving that are stimulating that follow a child's interests and that go back and forth and so the basics, as you heard in the video, are five simple messages. And we've done this now in many communities. We've supported the basics. And what I hear back from our uh, all of our early educators is that parents say, this is something, this is empowering. Uh, this is something that I can do. I already do it somewhat, and I can do it more. I can be more deliberate, more intentional. Yes. And and so the five principles are maximize love, manage stress, talk, sing, and point, count, group, and compare, explore through movement and play, and read and discuss stories. And um, what we're doing in the city of York is really working on saturating the community. We want our libraries, our schools. So in I have presented in Hannah Penn, I've presented to all the teachers up through eighth grade because they may have students in their classes who have younger siblings back at home. And so they're sharing with all of those families. We're sharing through your child care centers. And so the YWCA, uh, York Day Nursery, the Head Starts, all the district pre-K, they're all the teachers. We want them all sharing this. They're trusted messengers. Likewise, uh, we want to, we've got the Family First Health Clinic at, uh, uh, at Hannah Penn. They're sharing this. We want to reach out to more pediatricians and family doctors. And then we're here today to talk specifically about our places of worship. And that is to say we want mm -hmm. our organizations, we would love to work with you and your religious education leaders to share this with your families. So that's mm -hmm. another. And so we want 
all of this and what the research shows i'm going to let somebody in um um what the research shows is that um that the if parents hear this message from trusted messengers and they hear it a lot think about the campaign against smoking you heard that a lot mm -hmm. lowered the the number of of, of um of people who smoke likewise you want to hear this a, a lot and you since you want to get everybody in the city singing from the same hymnal mm -hmm. and so uh how do we do this so they call this socio that fancy term socio-ecological saturation we can just say community saturation we want to get everybody singing from the same hymnal so here's how we do it first of all um Dr. Barry has uh, signed us up for the basics texting service. Families use, you know, get most of their information from their phones. And so we can sign up families. We're going to have a flyer. Families can click on a URL or a QR code and sign up. Uh, they give a little, just, just give basic information, how old their child is. Uh, and that then, um, uh, with that, they'll get two texts a week, uh, one text on why something is important, and then a, another text uh, on a little bit later in the week on, on how to do it, a good tip for how to do it. So texting is one way, all right? Mm -hmm. And here's a mom uh, saying, I signed up, it's called Basics Insights, the texting service. And so here's a quote, I signed up for Basics uh, uh, Insights shortly after my son was born. Uh, my four-year-old daughter and I read them together so she can learn facts about her baby brother and do the suggested activities right along with me. Not only do these texts provide useful information, but I now have weekly affirmations that I'm giving my son the thing he needs to grow and learn. So uh, what a beautiful thing for yeah. a mom to say. And again, Dr. Barry's, uh, you know, has uh, allocated, has identified the funds for this. We're signed up. We can get this out uh, uh, right away. Uh, the second is that there's lots of free materials. There's videos, um, and I'd love to show one more video uh, 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 to you. So there's videos about each of the basics, and then there's print materials and on, uh, online and handouts. So we've had new people enter. So Dr. Bates, it's okay with you if I show one more video? It's about four minutes. Ooh. Sure, absolutely. All right, great. Let's do that. So um, I've got it all uh, teed up here to go. So there's four minute videos. And for those of you who are new, welcome. I'm David Jacobson. Uh, I am sharing a, about um, a parenting campaign that we are uh, saturating the city of York with. And we want all of your help in getting this out. We want all of our faith-based organizations to help and uh, all of our, uh, all the other organizations, all the nonprofits and schools and early childhood programs that, that work with children and families. We want all of them to help getting the word out about these five basics. And so I'm gonna show you, so they are maximize love, manage stress, talk, sing, and point, count, group, and compare, Explore through movement and play and read and discuss stories. I'm going to show you now the video about maximize love and manage stress. Let me know if you don't hear the sound. Babies thrive when the world feels loving, safe, and predictable. So when we say maximize love, we're talking about the things that you can do to help your baby feel loved, happy, and safe. Right? No. <laughs> it's really important to show them a lot of love. Wrapping her allows me to be hands-free, and it also shows her that um, I love her, I guess. <laughs> she is born now. The simplest way to maximize love is to express affection. Hugging and cuddling, smiling and laughing, playing silly games together. These are all ways to communicate how much you love them. Other ways are by encouraging and showing excitement when they try something new or difficult. Yes! I love it! You know, good old fashioned hugging, kissing, 
letting her know we love her. It also teaches them about the give and take of communication. Good job. I need a hug. You need a hug? Okay. Respond to your child's sounds, gestures, and facial expressions. If you pay attention, you will learn what your baby is trying to signal. <laughs> Having standard daily routines is a way to make the world feel predictable for your child, and it's also a way to manage your own stress. We have meal routines, we have bedtime routines, so we have bath time before bed and play, and then we'll read together. So that's kind of a rhythm that we have. Routines help your child know what to expect. They can be comforting, they can also help with transitions. She knows when the house just starts to quiet down and settle down, she knows it's time to go to bed. If I come home and Dom is stressed, I try to take on that stress. Because yeah. I can say to her, like, let me help you out, let me control this, right, right. what I can control. Stress is just a part of life. Some stress is normal and even important because it helps children learn how to cope with stress that they're likely to experience in the future as part of their everyday lives. Being loving and responsive are ways to help your child to cope with and ultimately recover from the stresses of everyday life. The point is not to be stress-free. The point is for you and your child to survive those moments of stress, to overcome them, and to continue toward being your best self. I'm going to have a very honest moment. I am yeah, stressed fine. a lot. But I think one thing I've learned is to get out every day and to just let it go. Because the relationship is so close, your own feelings can affect your child's feelings. So it's important to take care of yourself. One of the best ways to feel at peace and to manage your own stress is just to hold the baby close. There are times when I get stressed, but I also think about what a great gift this is. Ultimately, nothing in life is more important or more rewarding than the bond of love between a parent and a child. Cherish your child and take care of yourself. That's the message. They are my reward. These cute little faces. Look at that. Yeah. Look at that boo boo. I can't wait for them to be able to give mommy a kiss back. Okay, what do we think of that one? He just puts a smile on your face, just look at it. <laughs> it brings back memories. <laughs> yeah, it's, it starts as an infant. Uh, uh -huh. um, there's a lot of pictures there on, on the video of, of infant babies, and um, it shows that infants can learn how to love because of the love that you give out to them. They receive it, and they'll uh, they'll reciprocate with that and give it back. So That's you're right. instilling in them at a very early age that you love them, and That's right. what's needed in, in families today. Absolutely, absolutely. We refer to that. Uh, they were it, it, it is serve and return. We serve. We make a gesture, we laugh, we kiss, we ex we're expressive with our children, and then they learn to return that, serve and return. And that back and forth is how that learning happens at a really a early age. So you're absolutely uh, right about that. Okay, so now uh, that was the video. I'm gonna now, sh 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 so, so there are videos just like that for all five, and they're in 14 different languages. So we can reach, uh, we've got Haitian Creole, we've got Spanish, we've got, we can reach uh, all the families in your community with these videos. So the, again, we've got the texting service, we've got the video and print materials, so we've got lots of handouts and tip sheets. We've got the videos that, uh, that you just saw, we can have our pediatricians running them in their waiting rooms. Um, we can show them in Play and Learns. We can have our early childhood programs show them. They're free online. Families can go and play them themselves. Uh, the third is, I think, the most important. Positive social reinforcements from trusted messengers. You're only going to do this. So back to Catherine Rose's question. You're only going to do this if you hear it a lot and if the people that you trust 
share this with you, which is why we want our librarians, our early childhood teachers, and our religious education teachers in our churches all sharing this with families. And then the third is opportunities for parents to play leadership and advisory roles. So over time, we want to involve parents in, um, in this basics campaign and develop a cadre of champions to help lead this work. So I'll just, I couldn't resist, uh, share one more idea. I don't know if uh, down the road in the city of York, uh, this was done in uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts. So a community not unlike York. And um, they managed to find some grant funding uh, and they gave small grants to five artists and each one took a basic. And then they put them on storefronts. Storefronts would donate like windows, and um, and they put these around town. These different basics messengers. This is an artist who had never done a self portrait before, and these are his twin girls. And he took maximize love, man, and stress. Here's one for count, group, and compare. You can see all the different ways you can compare the butterflies by color, by dots, by hearts, by closed dots. So anyway, um, some fun things uh, that we could consider doing. Uh, so that's the um, basics um, campaign in a nutshell. Uh, what none of us can do alone, all of us can do together. And again, it's about these four different ways of reaching families through the texting service, which again, we can sign up all the families we can sign up, I mean, for at least for, for, for a while. Uh, uh, and we've got um, uh, the video and print materials. We want to get all the trusted messengers involved and um, eventually have parents play leadership roles. So these are all things that our, our, our faith-based organizations can help with. And, you know, I would really like to hear your advice um, how can we get our churches and our real religious education uh, uh, educators sharing the texting service, sharing the, the tip sheets, putting posters up in where you have religious education uh, for families, and talking up the basics with your families? How can we get our churches involved in doing that? Okay, <clears throat> that was uh, the presentation that uh, Dr. Barry shared with the faith-based faith group, but we wanted to make sure that this committee saw uh, this is one of the big initiatives for the school district, uh, because we all do know that if we get them early, we can gain more and have academic growth for the students. Um, Dr. Barry, would you like to close out? This portion. I just wanted to know if anyone has any questions or um, additional comments about the first 10 that they'd like me to address. Okay, Dr. Fu, that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Dr. Barry. Um, this, I want to stress the importance that, you know, all these resources are free. Uh, the initiative and in working with other partners in the community is going to be a very positive aspect of the program, especially for the school district taking the lead. Uh, the fact that Ms. Fady and her pre-K pro program are working closely with a lot of the providers in the community has really helped so that we have some consistency and the students are coming better prepared for kindergarten and better prepared for what the future is going to hold for them. So thank you for uh, bearing with us on a video presentation, but we felt it was important enough that we had to share it. Our next meeting is May 11th, Wednesday at six o'clock again. Uh, if you have any suggestions for topics, please send them our way. We'll be glad to uh, try and get whatever we can for you. And if there's any questions, Please contact Dr. Barry, contact me, or anyone on the committee. You know, don't be afraid to ask uh, for help or to say, hey, why don't we try this? So I want to say thank you to everybody. 
and I'll open it up for any last comments from any of the committee members. And if there aren't any, I want to say thank you and have a safe and very nice holiday right this coming weekend. Uh, no you. comments. Have a good evening and thank you very much for joining us.